All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It's a minute after nine. I'm sure some more folks will probably trickle in while we're started here, but we'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, so obviously everybody knows today is a very um, important day in our history in Jefferson City. I've got my JC Strong shirt on. I know Randy's got his on. Um, so um, we just kind of wanted to recognize uh, the importance of today. Um, and there's a, an event coming. Uh, it's called the Caravan. Um, and it's going to be a bunch of, um, I think, 23 vehicles from United Way are going to caravan around Jefferson City um, and recognize different agencies and organizations that had a hand in the tornado recovery. So um, the Jeff City Chamber is along the route um, on Adams Street right here in front of our building. So um, we're inviting anybody that wants a place to come be a part of the uh, caravan. Um, you can join us. So we're going to be on the chamber steps. And I believe the caravan's coming by about 8.37 this morning. So we'll just be out there from like 8.30 to 8.50. Um, and we've got our JC Strong shirts on. Um, and we also have some signs made up that say JC Strong and, um, you know, together, moving forward. Um, so if you, if you want to be a part of that and you have a sign or you want to make a sign, we've got some poster board here. Um, so we invite you to be a part of that and recognize those um, people that have had a hand in the recovery. So uh, moving on to Friday coffee. Thank you very much for coming to virtual Friday coffee. Um, sorry. If it's Kelsey, it, 830 isn't going to be working. It's at 10 o'clock. It begins at 10 o'clock because I'm riding with Lieutenant Governor Kehoe. Oh, I'm sorry. You're exactly right. I, it was 1030 to 1050. I just had it wrong on my piece of paper here. I apologize. So you meet us me. out front 1030 to 1050 this morning, not 830. <laughs> Y'all see there was going to be a race off of this thing and come back out here and get back in it again, it looks like. There you go. Um, so I will go ahead. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And I apologize that this is kind of Groundhog Day for some of you with these housekeeping items, but uh, this is for anybody that has not attended these calls before. Um, so just a couple housekeeping items. Um, you'll notice everyone is muted. Um, that's just to prevent any background noise and make sure everybody can hear the speaker. Um, and then we also recommend if you want to change from gallery view to speaker view up in the top right hand corner, that allows you to view the speaker when they're speaking um, full screen and then it'll switch back and forth between the speakers. Um, and then if you have any questions for the speaker or for Randy or for any of the staff, um, you can put those questions in the chat window. And there's a button on the bottom of your screen that says chat and that'll bring up that window for you to type that in. Um, and lastly, we just ask that you don't record or reuse or reproduce any of the content um, that we share today unless you get prior permission from us. So I will unshare my screen and let's make sure Rochelle is unmuted here. And we will let Rochelle tell us a little bit about sponsorship opportunities for Friday Coffee. Rochelle, you're still muted. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Yeah, Cumulus Media has been a sponsor. We are excited to continue to be a sponsor of the Friday Coffee. We're thrilled that it's once a week now, not just once a month. Um, it's a little more convenient. So I noticed, noticed the attendance has gradually been even more increasing. But with uh, Cumulus, you know, with our seven radio stations, we communicate to close to 200,000 people in the mid-Missouri area each week. And so as a sponsor of Friday Coffee, not only do you get to be a presenting host here and focus and, and present your business in front of everyone. Um, we'll also sit down with you, Cumula, a representative from Cumulus Media will sit with you and we'll draft a audio campaign to kind of help you promote your business and help you promote you being a sponsor of Friday Coffee. Um, awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I've got a logo in the background here. The Midmo is open, and I didn't know if you'd like me to discuss that right now because that's one sure. of the things, one of the features Mid, uh, Cumulus has done. You know, I'm local here in Jefferson City, but Cumulus, our um, CEO, is out of New York. So Cumulus um, nationwide, what we've done is created this 
wherever the community is open and we're letting everyone, all of our listeners across the, the globe know what different small businesses, large businesses are doing and how they're kind of transitioning back into this crazy time. And so I'm proud to um, kind of present to everyone here a free um, platform for people to kind of go to and focus their business, but fill, spend about five minutes, fill out a form, and then we'll kind of draft a meeting place for everyone to go to. Um, just check out the site. It's very self-explanatory, and it's kind of nice that we're updating it quite often because we're seeing weekly in the Columbia, Jeff City area, even at like the Ozarks, how things are changing and how businesses are adapting. And it's kind of neat because it's one place. We're advertising on the radio, too, to let people know what businesses are doing to thrive in this crazy time. Rochelle, what's the link to that website? Exactly that, midmoisopen.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. That's very helpful to our, our businesses. Um, and we'll go ahead and, uh, and pass it along to Randy. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Do this if you can hear me. No? Okay. Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse. Okay. <laughs> good morning, everybody. This is the, I believe it's the seventh. Friday coffee? Kelsey, is that right? Sorry, you have to ask you questions. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, so uh, what we want to talk about uh, today is uh, the legislative session, 2020 legislative session, uh, and we have a, a couple people here today that are going to help us with that. Uh, one was advertised, and that's Rudy Veet, and we'll I'll introduce him in a minute, and the other one is Richard Sheets. Richard is with the uh, uh, Missouri Municipal League, and he's got a lot of background, uh, obviously, on legislation that affects uh, uh, local communities uh, and cities in particular. But the one thing he has a real expertise in is the use tax, and I'm going to call it Wayfair because that's what everybody describes it as. So I know that uh, that was not successful this year, but we're very interested in that in Jefferson City, and I wanted uh, Richard to kind of give us his his uh, thoughts on it, and then we can have some conversation. But first, let me introduce uh, Representative Rudy Veet. Rudy is a good friend of mine, longtime friend, and uh, state representative from the 59th district. I will point out that uh, uh, generally, uh, these guys that are in the rural districts, and I think Rudy would say that's a rural district, Eastern Cole County, they don't have any, any uh, components in the city. I will say that there are two precincts in Jefferson City that are in Rudy's district and I happen to be in one. So I'm actually proud of that and uh, glad Rudy represents me. So with that, Rudy, I'm gonna open it up to you and you can kind of fill us in on your thoughts on the legislative session and uh, you know whatever other ideas that you have about maybe what'll happen this summer. And then one thing I also wanna ask you about is the budget. So I know I've dropped a lot of that on you so far, but obviously people are concerned about what's going on with the budget. So, Representative Rudy V. Well, this is my first time actually doing one of these where I'm supposed to be the main speaker, so give me a little bit of break, but I will tell you that <clears throat> even though I don't have that much of Jeff City in my district, I truly believe that what's good for the county is good for the city, and what's good for the city is good for the county. Uh, we are intertwined so many ways that <clears throat> that uh, you know we're inseparable so we need to work together as to what's happened i guess we want to talk about well we'll talk about the port authority bill just shortly okay. i just want to say thank you to rick mahalovich and the port authority people and what randy allen and the chamber has done to work with me to get this bill uh the uh, bill to the governor a lot of work's ahead of us but it's impossible to do too much planning and get people motivated if we don't have the site as in any industry. We, I believe the governor will sign this and we'll have to make some negotiations yet. But I think that, that um, you know, this session there were so many good bills that died and, so, and a few not so good bills that didn't. But uh, it, it made it through and, and certainly Randy came by, Senator. Mike Burns Cutter, Dave Griffin, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kehoe, everybody kept the pressure because everybody up there is fighting to get their own bill through. And there were a lot of bills and a lot of legislatures and a small time to do it in. So I do want to thank you for that. I thank the chamber. Uh, I have great faith in the chamber and the Port Authority bill. Will, Port Authority group will, and Callaway County, continue to, to 
that project and, and stay on top of it. As far as um, one of the things I was going to talk about was House Bill 1854. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Sweeney's here because there is a lot in that bill. I think it's a simple bill, came through, titled something to do with some minor thing, but there's 29 sub, sub bills in it. <clears throat> the budget, <coughs> uh, we came back for and worked on a budget when some people were, thought we shouldn't have, but we truly did need to get a budget out there. We have so many state agencies and so many people relying upon the state that they have to have some projection of what, what they can do. And our budget, we probably will be back. We'll probably make some changes, but they need the best information we have at the time. You know, budgets are never in concrete. They are projections. And that's what we have to do that because we have so many state agencies and so many businesses that rely upon that here in Jeff City. It is critical that we keep everybody informed. As you know, state employees pay was not in there this year. And I hear the same old song though up there. Well, they need it. They're underpaid. We don't have money. This year, it is a crisis, but I need to everybody to keep pressure on everybody to keep the priority up there. It is a priority. It is needed. It's good for our community, but it's good for the state. There were, from the chamber standpoint, there was a punitive damage uh, bill that did pass. <clears throat> it had some different language in it. There's some language on the Manufacturing Merchandising Practicing Act, uh, which has to do with deceitful trade practices and that that's some modifications made on there. Um, some that will affect you individually is <clears throat> there's been some more changes on the re real ID uh, law and ultimately we're going to most of us need to get our driver's license for real ID. Uh, they're working on getting a digital driver's license which you know with time is a lot of people can have right on their phone won't be carrying their license. Uh, <clears throat> Hey, Rudy, can I interrupt you there for a minute? Yeah, you interrupt me as often as you want to. Okay, so what is the deadline? Tell me, tell us about that real ID. What is the actual deadline? I know it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Some people well, told me last week they went in and got one. So tell us a little bit about that real ID. I think it's been kicked back to October of next year. Okay, okay. But I mean, it's something that most states have it, and I know there's some controversy about it, but about government getting your assets, but there were provisions put in there that they have to destroy a lot of the information you give them. Uh, if you have a passport now, it's not hard to get. Otherwise, when you get one, they're gonna, there's a list you go on the website and tell you what documents you have to have there. It's not only important if you want to travel without your uh, passport. Now, again, it will not get you on international flights, but it does on, on, stay, on uh, United States flights. Uh, and it also, some of us do end up in military bases and that you need, you need that to get on the military bases and uh, it's going to happen. As the government adds other requirements for ID, I assume that this one will be the method for um, entry or participation or whatever in these, in these federal government uh, programs, correct? This is this ID is supposed to completely require with all the existing gov federal government requirements, including the state of Missouri, including the state of Missouri. Okay. The new ID, yes. Okay. Okay. <coughs> all right. Sorry for I just wanted to make no, sure. No, no, and that's anybody have questions. I I certainly want to ask questions because if I look at uh, I looked at eighteen fifty four. There's twenty nine subsections to it, uh, and I will be honest with you. I try to read every bill up there. Those last two weeks, bills were coming in that were never vetted. They were just shoved out in front of us. Uh, they were some of them, you know, not even highlighted. We can make some significant changes with a few words. So uh, as usual, I do have, and I'm not complaining about the legislature. I love the legislature and I think it's a challenging time, but I do wish we would make more effort to address bills early on, get those done, instead of doing what I call the Christmas tree approach, dumping everything on there and hiding a bunch of bills in there that would not ordinarily pass. It sounds 
something we should be able to resolve real easy. It's not because people use it for various reasons. There are bills that would never see the light of day without the Christmas tree approach. I know one of my great disappointments is that Wayfair was not addressed this year. And I know you have a speaker coming up to talk on Wayfair, but from my standpoint, and we have a group there called the Lincoln Conservatives. There's a really conservative Tea Party type conservative group. And then we have Lincoln Conservatives, which is about 40 of us now that we started already. And we want to be more open-minded on things. And Wayfair is one of the areas where uh, we think it needs to be passed. It's not fair for the local businessmen to pay taxes and somebody go on the internet and doesn't do it. There's no way for them to compete. We think taxes are being uh, internet sales taxes are going up every day, so your local taxes are going to go down. We believe that your local communities need this tax uh, to function. We're going to have the, the fallout effect if we keep not collecting any of these taxes. Jeff City, St. all your small towns that we rely upon some sort of tax are going to be hit hard. There's a new method out there called Streamline, which can collect all these tax. So technology we have it available. It's not a new tax, it's an existing tax. It's just a, may, a way of collecting it. Uh, in our caucus, the, the three issues in the, at the legislature are one is revenue neutral. The other one is revenue come in to designated funds. And the other one is revenue going into uh, the general fund. Rudy, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to stop you right there. And I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard since you started talking about this. Yes, that would be uh, great. Okay. And then we can have some dialogue on it. So uh, I've known Richard for a long time. He's been with the Missouri Municipal League for, I don't know how long, but forever. Several and, years. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and he is very, he is the go-to person on issues like that, that affect the, uh, the local communities in particular the cities. So I'm going to turn this over to Richard and, and Richard, why don't you go ahead and give us an overview and, okay. and then we'll get into some discussion. Okay. And I appreciate um, Representative Veet's uh, comments and his work at the Capitol and, and, and the Lincoln caucus. The Lincoln caucus is a true uh, uh, shining light at the Capitol. And uh, we're, we're, um, we're really fortunate to have those group of legislators having that broad perspective and kind of an open mind. Um, well, talking about wafer, which is, is really the you know collection of, of, uh, of taxes from uh, out-of-state sellers, both catalog and remote sales, and it's been an issue that's been going around, been been around for a long time since the '70s, actually. Uh, but it really has been highlighted and became more uh, of an urgent concern since we have the internet, because now we have more, as you all know, more shopping. Uh, on the internet and um, many of our local uh, retailers, you all are feeling the, the pain of that, uh, the, the sales are moving out of state. And two years ago, our US Supreme Court realized that and reversed a couple of their uh, earlier decisions that said that the earlier decision said that the businesses had to have a physical presence in the state before uh, the state can collect their sales or use taxes. Well, they reversed that decision because of the changing uh, uh, environment we have now in our sales and uh, gave us an opportunity to start collecting uh, state and local uh, sales and use taxes. Uh, and, um, and that's what we've been considering for the last couple of years. And, and actually, I guess the key, the key word I like to, like to characterize this year I mean, it's an unprecedented session. I mean, every every session has its own personality, but this this year, as Representative Veet could testify, is just it's unprecedented. And we had short time to do anything. We had that of a large break. Um, but the the way I really characterize the Wayfair, the internet sales issue right now is kind of disappointing. Um, I think we have broad support, broad support uh, for legislation. I I don't know anyone that really does not want to pass a Wayfair bill. Everyone sees the importance in that, but other things get in the way. Um, um, and, and, you know, the, the, there's been a number of bills this year, and I'm not going to bore you with the numbers unless you ask, you want to know those numbers, I can get those to, I have those right here, but um, uh, 
you know, we've really worked out most of the details, or the, the, we have worked out all the details, all the, the uh, uh, sticking points, the points in collection, be sure that, you know, the credit card companies aren't, aren't um, uh, considered a marketplace facilitator, how do we collect it? All those, those things have been worked out. Uh, and the, mainly the three bills that were, were uh, moving this session all included those sec sessions, those sections that made this this uh, collection work. Um, what's the sticking point is is offsets, and and Representative Veet mentioned revenue neutral. There are some legislators uh, that believe that uh, any Wayfair bill should be any revenue coming in from Wayfair, both at the state and local level, needs to be offset by some other. Uh, revenue reduction. Income tax for the state, uh, local government, it's kind of a harder um, uh, thing to, to come terms with. Um, what came at the last of the session was an offset in local cable television franchise fees. Uh, and, and so those are the sticking points. That's what's really, that's what's preventing Wayfair from passing. Um, uh, and, and that's, that's really disappointing uh, because this is n internet sales capturing the use tax from internet so is not new taxes uh, and particularly for businesses um, you know how our system works we have a use tax for out of state sales that's been around for probably over 15 years probably closer to 20 years um, and uh, who's really collecting that and paying that tax right now are businesses, local businesses. Uh, they're paying the use tax uh, they have for years uh, and uh, really bearing the burden of that, of that, of that tax. And what we need to do is, is uh, apply that to all sellers uh, of that sell to citizens in the state. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what our legislation does. All the legislation does. Uh, but the offsets are a stumbling block that just keeps the bill from passing every year. Where, Richard, where did this cable TV franchise fees come from? <laughs> Good, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> glad you asked. That's, that's, um, it hasn't always been in the debate. Uh, that really kind of cropped up a couple years ago. Uh, you know, because the big picture, and it really kind of, how, you know, what we're really facing now in, in this country, in this state, is our changing technology has not really, uh, has changed and our tax structures across the board have not, it's not kept up with technology. We see that all the time. Uh, we see that with the internet sales, we see that, and we see that with our cable franchising, the telecommunications taxes they pay to use the right of way. Um, the cable companies uh, have a problem. People are cutting the cord and going to streaming. And um, and we've talked with them in trying to fix that issue because it's an issue for cities too because you know loss of their their customers means loss of cable rep revenue for a, a franchise fee for cities so we have a common issue here um, the problem is how do you bring Hulu Amazon Prime all those streaming services um, into that tax structure or that fee structure it's it's very difficult. Um, we have some constitutional issues with Hancock, um, and it, it is not an easy fix. Uh, so when there's not an easy fix, they come up with a really easy fix and just cut local, local revenue. So they, the cable industry came back with a bill that would just substantially reduce local uh, cable franchise fees. And of yeah. course, we were adamantly opposed to that, yeah. um, but we've been working with, with the with the cable uh, industry trying to work out to some solution. Uh, Senator Emery, uh, who sponsored the bill in the Senate, working with him to uh, kind of come to some terms. But it, it's kind of hard. And this, in this session, it, it, it's difficult because we had such a large break. And because of the, the, the pandemic, um, it just cut the time we could really come to some kind of agreement. Um, so, um, Rudy, can Rudy, uh, uh, Kind of piggybacking on that is, do we have to wait to to for a handful of senators to term out before this kind of bill can go forward, or or um, 
and Richard can weigh in on that too. What do you think, Rudy? Uh, the first thing I want to say is I want to thank Richard. And, and, you know, we talk, people say bad things about lobbyists. They know more about a given bill than any of us know and any of us individually can keep up with there. And they are, you know, that's one of the things this session with the court, but they're what has made lobbies at there at the end. And so mm -hmm. some bills were moving through so fast and trying to keep up on without somebody who had, who knew the subject was a real challenge. And, um, you know, it's not a new tax. It's the only method of collecting tax. Every day with more internet sales, our regular taxes are gonna be hurt more. Our municipalities, our local governments are gonna be hurt more if we don't set up a method. And I believe there are several proposals and the, the revenue neutral, my version of revenue neutral is let's put, put it into general revenue and leave it up to the legislature right. to determine how it goes and, and address our needs. You know, there, there also, which is a bill that may be more likely to make it through, or they're going to go to certain funds and that. But that's assuming that we're smarter than the next generation of legislators will be. So we want to tie their hands as to how they can use the money. I don't believe that. I believe that, that the next legislative session or group will be a smarter, smarter, and be more adapt to the changing times than we are. And so we shouldn't tie hands up. The revenue neutral one, there's nothing revenue neutral about it. They're gonna be taking money from when your grandkids shop on the internet, your grandmother, or you do, or people that aren't paying income tax. We're gonna collect the money from them and give it back to the people in terms of tax reduction. That just doesn't sell very well to me. And also, you know, you know in the, the question is how much will um, a Wayfair fix bring in? And the number ranges from 800, mm -hmm. 80 million to 200 million. I mean, it, it's just all over the board. So how do you, how do you make that revenue neutral? And Representative Vita is absolutely right. That's what our, that's what our budget appropriation process is all about. And, and if, you know, that money comes in uh, and, this, and, the, and the legislature determines how that's spent, what we need to, you know, use that money for or what needs to be cut. Um, and, but, um, but actually, you know, I think we're coming closer. The governor had uh, his uh, proposal of having that reserve fund and earmarking some of those funds uh, for some key issues. Um, and um, I, I think some of the members are, and it's, it's a, we have a conservative caucus in the six members conservative caucus in, in the Senate that are really pushing for a income tax offset. I mean, there, that's, that's, they won't budge. But actually, um, right before the, the pandemic break, I call it, uh, uh, the conservative caucus and the governor's office were kind of getting closer. I mean, I was feeling pretty optimistic. I mean, they were talking about a, a, a income tax in, income tax offset, but it was a really smaller one. I, I, I believe, believe we would have come to some terms on that. Um, but then when we came back, it, the whole dynamics changed. Uh, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of, uh, of feelings and, and, and personalities get involved in here. And uh, in the Senate, what happened, uh, Senator Koenig had, has Senate Bill 648. That bill has one that's really been moving in the Senate. That's one, really the bill that's been the go-to bill on, on Wayfair. And we've worked with the senator for the last couple of years and worked out a lot of issues. When they came back to the Senate after the, after the pandemic break, uh, they didn't go to the senator's bill. They went to Senator Cunningham's bill, which is the governor's bill, and it's a good bill. And that didn't make Senator Koenig very happy. Okay. So that kind of shut things down a little bit. Uh, and that's just kind of what's been happening. Hey, so one of the things I'm interested in particularly is the effect of not having this bill on mm -hmm. municipalities and local people. So I, I know, I see we have a, a, a city councilman online, Rick Mahalovich. Uh, what, hey, Rick, what is I the, okay, okay. Uh, okay. We, I want to show you, thing. thank you. I do have to leave. And certainly I've looked at the governor's bill I'm, and, and I know it takes compromise up there to work. And, so, but I think, um, for raising taxes, but there are certain things that we have to do and, and obligations we need to meet. And I appreciate uh, everything you are doing for that and possibly getting a gas tax bill through or, or both on, dead on arrival, but I think 
started to be needed real importantly for our communities and for our industries and everything. But thank you for your support. And I am always there. Uh, and again, I don't dislike lobbyists. I may not agree with <laughs> I, I have a much more, I can make a more intelligent vote. Hey, uh, Rudy, thanks a lot for all you do. Uh, I think uh, we can all say, and I know if uh, I unmute Rick Mahalovich here in a minute, uh, he'll, he will say that uh, it was mainly up to you the, that this bill went all the way through and uh, on, the, on, the, on the Port Authority. So thank you so much, and you have a good weekend. And thank you, and it's team effort. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rick, I was going to ask uh, about, I know that the cities are extremely interested in uh, this revenue that is currently being lost because we don't have a use tax or whatever in place and this, and this bill authorizing the collection of that. Uh, would you give us some comments about how that might, how, how, how that affects the city government? Well, first of all, I wanted to veep for all the work he did on the um, on the port bill, as well as the, the what I'd call the Missouri, the Central Missouri delegation of uh, Griffith, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kehoe, Senator Bernsketter, and many, many others, the chamber, and and uh, it was a team effort that got that thing uh, over the goal line in a short, really short two years. Uh, back, back to, and I think uh, Richard, for all the work he does in behalf of the uh, cities of the state, and specifically with regard to this, um, this particular uh, issue. We, we tried to pass a, a use tax, what was it, two years ago, Randy? Correct. And, and it just has that, it's hard to explain, it's hard to um, communicate, uh, and and uh, it just, the, the Wayfair seems to be the right way to go to, to solve it for everybody. And I know I, I posted there that uh, to everyone that we have a 12 million, we depend on sales tax for 12 million out of a $33 million budget. We're gonna expect a, a fairly large hit on that. And as a city, we, we have a policy of 70% of that budget will be used as a fund balance. So we have a little cushion. Uh, that being said, we just went through a flood and a tornado a year ago. So uh, that rainy day fund is starting to, starting to be so critical to our planning. Um, on the hills of this, we're, we have a capital uh, improvement tax for, for both the city and the county, which is wildly popular. I think it passed by over 70% uh, uh, for the county and the city. And, and it identifies key projects. And while the bulk of the money uh, that comes out of sales tax probably is out of the city of Jefferson, it impacts the entire county in, in, in numerous ways. And uh, I think the voters really appreciate the fact that we outline how the money is to be spent. So. Uh, I know there is a group uh, of business folks in town that want to, uh, that are interested in, in promoting the use tax. I think they're waiting for kind of um, an opportunity of whether or not they have a groundswell of support from the Eastside Business Association, from the Downtown Association, Westside, all the associations from a, from a business standpoint of promoting this. Uh, uh, so. They're kind of looking towards, I think, uh, the General Assembly and advice on Wayfair and, and, and maybe give another run at this use tax uh, on the ballot. Um, it will not be, it's too late for the August ballot, but it could happen probably uh, municipal election next April. Um, so I, I believe based on what I know about our city budget as a finance uh, chair, uh, it, it, it's going to be critical going down the road. We, we really struggled with uh, a fleet replacement for our uh, public uh, safety folks. And uh, those needs continue to grow up and, and, uh, and our resources seem to be uh, uh, flat. I, I'd open for any questions, but I don't want to steal the thunder from Richard and, and again, appreciate the work of the it's, it's municipal. A, Richard, do, uh, one question I've always had with this is, do the city, uh, it's a little bit confusing to me. So if, Wayfair, if the Wayfair bill is passed in the legislature, it simply allows a collection method that is like sales tax. Would that be fair? And then does the, does the city of Jefferson still have to pass a local ordinance 
allowing them to to uh, get in that mix? Yes, they do. They still have. It, it really doesn't. We already have a use tax, and you know, when, we, when when Wayfair that when uh, Wayfair versus South Dakota uh, Supreme Court case came down, you know, we were all very excited. Going, oh my gosh! Now we don't have to worry about this use tax issue. We could all apply our sales tax, and it just be really easy. Well, we convened a group of county officials and city officials, and and retained a. Uh, I don't even know Carol Isles. She she's, uh, does a lot of uh, sales tax uh, work, and we retained her services. And we reviewed that the statutes and came to the conclusion that sales tax is not going to work. We're going to have to go with our traditional, our current system with a use tax for out of state mm -hmm. sales and the sales for you. So that's their sales for in state sales. So that's why we continue the use tax. And, um, and, and so there is a local use tax. Right, right now there's about 202 cities that have a use tax, probably maybe 80 counties. Um, but each jurisdiction has to have voter approval. Uh, one thing that uh, hopefully will pass this year, it, it, the bill passed, we'll see if the governor signed it, because as Rudy said, we have a, a lot of these huge Christmas tree bills and this is a, one of those Christmas tree, tree bills that have good things and bad things. One of the problems, um, it, you know, our ballot wording for the local use tax is pretty clumsy. It, it just, it, but the wording that we that were required by the statutes um, made it made it very difficult. I think for voters to understand what the issue was. We changed. We have a we, we have had a bill introduced to change just that ballot wording. It passed in House Bill eighteen fifty four, uh, one hundred fifty page bill with a bunch of other stuff in it. Hopefully. Uh, the governor will sign that and it might be a little bit easier for cities to um, get that across the finish line. Uh, but um, cities would have to still, and counties would still have to go to the voters to get that uh, tax. Yeah, I had the same, I had the same euphoria when I heard about the Supreme Court ruling. Right. And I thought, exactly. we're just, we'll just, we'll just collect it just like a sales tax. I mean, why not right. exactly. add them to it? It would have been very <laughs> simple, but obviously right. nothing is simple. And part of it, I not think- Part of it is when the legislature created back in the original, um, oh, what was the Supreme Court case that started all this? Um, oh, God, it goes back to, it goes back to the 70s, the uh, Bella, Hay, Bella Hess decision in the 70s. Okay, and then there's the, okay. Uh, one in the 80s, yeah. Uh -huh. right. Okay, so I guess all of that caused uh, some consternation. And, I, you know, whenever we right. fix something, we don't fix it. We, we fix some part of it and then we create problems for the other. So anyway, yeah. I was, yeah, I was, no. I, I was euphoric about the opportunity for cities to go ahead right. and just add these out of state sales to sales tax. So not going to happen. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, Rudy. Okay. So, so, this Rudy pandemic left just really high, uh, oh. so I'm going to, uh, Rudy has left us. He had to go to another uh, event. So I'm gonna just kind of go around the room here and see if anybody has any comments. And I see Frank's got his hand up. Frank Reisick. I would like to address the concept of offsets. And I would like to suggest that taxes have already been offset, which we, what we could call legalized tax evasion. Shopping through the internet is legalized tax evasion. So if you tell these senators that they have already been offset. We're not increasing taxes. We're just bringing up to what it used to be before this new legalized tax evasion has been created. You just, you just expressed our argument to uh, legislators. That's exactly right. You're absolutely right. It's, it is legalized evasion. They're, they're, these taxes are owed. They just were not able to capture those. You couldn't acquire those uh, those companies or those those sell retailers that uh, didn't have a physical presence in the state, we couldn't we couldn't go after them. But now, after that Supreme Court case, we can. So, um, but we have to make some changes to our statute to make that happen. Hey, R Richard. So uh, one of the I hurdles years ago was the fact that there was not a system. It would have been a big burden on small, <clears throat> medium-sized businesses to try to collect this from a hundred different places that they might sell to. Uh, and I think the technology has improved drastically. Is that, is that a fair statement? It, it, it really has. And, you know, we, we talk about streamline and streamline, the streamline, a compact that was 
created a number of years ago was a mechanism where all the states or a majority of states would, would standardize their sales tax laws and then that would convince Congress to uh, allow um, states to capture internet sales. Well, several things happened. Uh, the Supreme Court beat, the, beat Congress to the punch, which is not unusual. Um, and technology has made really streamlined, that streamlined compact concept uh, out of date. Uh, there are, they're called um, certified service providers. They can, uh, these companies uh, can for a relatively small amount of money uh, pinpoint uh, taxes down to longitude and latitude. It's, so it's, it's not an issue right now. That's just not a problem in, anymore. And, um, and those details we have, is those, those, those have been worked out in those three pieces of legislation. So we, ha we can collect it, we, can, we know what tax at a particular location uh, is, and, and that's not a concern anymore. Got it, okay, good. Uh, let's see, we had some other questions, but they were related to other legislation that I don't wanna put pressure on Richard to talk about. Anybody else wanna raise their hand or, uh, uh, you know, get into this conversation or maybe tell us a little bit about how COVID has affected them and their small business here. Um, we, have a, we have a few more minutes if anybody wants to, to share. I was going to call on Darcy Crane and I'm going to embarrass her because all of a sudden I don't see her in the, in, in the picture and, and ask her to uh, tell us about the Cancer Society. But since she's not there, uh, I'm going to embarrass that. Uh, young lady. So anybody else, anybody want to unmute their microphone and uh, ask a question or tell us a little bit about what's going on with their business? <gasps> hey, Darcy, un un unmute your microphone. Okay. Did, did you hear me embarrass you? Okay. I did. I have a new puppy. That's why you keep seeing me disappear because he's a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, that's, that's where I keep going. I'm in the same room. I'm just not behind the computer because the puppy keeps stealing things or, you know, whatever. So in a traditional Friday coffee, we would go around the room and everybody would talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what's going on with, uh, with them. And I know you posted something on the Cancer Society. What, why don't you uh, tell us what's going on? Well, obviously, this has greatly affected our huge fundraising events where we pull a lot of people together um so we have for sure this was back in march said no more in-person events through the month of june and i'm sure that will be reassessed very soon because it's going to be june and june will be over before we know it um right. and this is our huge fundraising time here because june is a very heavy month for relay for life events but we are turning a lot of them into something virtual not the same but you know just doing what we can because obviously our fundraising is down right now and you know our our need for fundraising is critical because now cancer patients need us more than ever um it's just it's a really hard time to be diagnosed with cancer and you know for us to provide services but then not have the critical funding that we usually do so we're, we're making the best of it and trying to figure out new fundraisers new virtual things and you know just changing the way we operate but we are still doing our best and we of course have had to not only change like our fundraising, but we've had to, you know, change how we're spending money and stuff too. And so we've made a lot of changes to decrease our expenses. Um, and some of those have been hard, but that's where we are and we're doing what we can. Sure. So get, uh, just to give me an estimate, ballpark estimate on the effect in dollars on the Cancer Society in, in our district here or in our location here with COVID? Um, Can you do that? Well, locally, I don't know a number. I have okay. most of my numbers okay. that I get are like for our region, which is 13 states. Okay. okay. Um, so but Relay for Life events are down, um, I think like 35% from where we normally are. 35%. Um, so. Wow. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Anybody else want to, uh, want to, oh, I see Joy's got her hand up. Unmute your microphone. Oh, there you go. Okay. 
<laughs> Hi, Randy. Good morning, what's everyone. What's going on, Joy? <laughs> Um, on June 4th, we are going to have uh, our second annual opioid summit for the year and at the Hawthorne Bank Community Room, but it will also be available via Zoom. Um, we have several presenters from around the country that are going to be Zoomed in and um, we will be serving lunch. Lunch is free. The event is free. It starts at 1130. Again, Hawthorne Bank Community Room. Um, it will be limited uh, space social distancing and whatever will abide by whatever guidelines come down uh, for effective June 1st. Um, so please let me know if you're interested in coming so we can make sure that we have sufficient room. Uh, the last one we had about 50 people, but it was a smaller room. So we're anticipating somewhere between 30 and 50 people. If you'd rather participate via Zoom, we'd love to have you June 4th at the Hawthorne Bank Community Room at 11.30 a.m. We're going to talk about what's being done regarding opioid crisis in Jefferson City, Central Missouri specifically, and um, what we can do to work together and collaborate even more in the future. Um, as you, as most people on the call probably realize, mental health, substance use have both increased throughout this COVID crisis. So um, we want to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our local community as best, the best way we know how. <laughs> and yeah, with the support so, of everyone. Yeah, so good, good point. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you that and you already answered the question is, what's, I mean, the impact, we all know that uh, the impact of this, just from the fact of the uh, uh, change in our economy. You know, I don't know what our latest unemployment uh, rate here is. Uh, in you know, we see the national numbers, and it looks like by the time next right. month hits, we'll be up to twenty percent unemployment. So that that has to have a huge effect on the medical med mental health uh, of our citizens. Yeah, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month, oh. so that I know Compass and, and several, United Way, several other of our partner agencies are putting out information about how to maintain positive mental health and, and things you can do. Um, you know, just the stresses. I, I know that uh, we had a law enforcement officer at our um, board meeting on Wednesday, and he mentioned that um, domestic violence has increased in the community for sure. So those are some of the concerns that we have that we're trying to address. And we know that substance use nationally has escalated. And I'm sure that that's no different in our community. So hopefully we can have a discussion on June 4th of ways that we can work together to um, help those people that need our help. Thank you, Joy. And, and uh, you know, pass along our thanks for all the work that you and, the, and uh, your organization does. Appreciate it. Thank you. And then okay. the other thing that I wanted to announce, sorry, one other big thing. On June 9th, we are celebrating our seniors awarding scholarships and recognizing those kiddos. And I really feel like they've been gypped this year <laughs> of a, one, all kinds of wonderful senior opportunities. So anybody that um, is courageous enough to come to the Capitol Plaza Hotel, again, we'll be doing whatever the restrictions are that come out. But June 9th, we will be recognizing our drug-free seniors and awarding five scholarships on that day and all of our students of the month for the entire year. Um, so 6 p.m. Capitol Plaza, June 9th, if you can come and help support those kids, I'd like to invite everybody to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> hey, I see Donna has uh, given us her smiling face this morning and uh, Donna Stone and she's got her JC Strong t-shirt on. Yay, yay. Uh, what, I know the realtors, the board of realtors and all the realtors that do such great work in our community have been affected by all this. What's, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on with the realtors. Um, they, um, th they're still busy. Um, I will tell you, it's a kind of a new way of doing business for them. Um, they are, um, you know, a lot more, um, cautious with, um, you know, showings and, uh, you know, they've just now started doing open houses probably within the last couple weeks. Um, so, you know, that's, it's kind of a, a new way of life for them, but, um, I was just going to share with you a few stats we've been, um, sure. We've been tracking every couple of weeks, um, kind of statistics and, and things. Um, one thing that I found very interesting from May 1st to May 15th, this year compared to last year, we actually had more under contracts this year than last year, which I thought was a very, like 10 more units under contract, which I thought was a very, I even double checked wow. that statistic. Um, 
which I thought was very unusual. But just to share a few other things with you, and pardon me, I'm going to, I'm looking at my computer, other computer. Um, new listings, um, we are down about 22%. So the inventory is still, um, you know, we need more, more, more properties on the market. Right. Um, the number of under contracts um, so far for the year, um, we're down about 14%. Um, but the number sold, which I'm, you know, very pleased when, again, when you're comparing May 1st um, to, or excuse me, January 1st to May 22nd, we're only down about 6% in the number of units sold. So that, um, when you look at that number compared to the national average, which is, um, I think, about 15, 17%, mm. we're, we're still holding pretty strong there. So, um, and uh, average sales price um, is actually, and I, all the, the, uh, information I'm giving you is single family um, Cole County. Um, average sale price is actually up this year, um, about 6%. But again, that's um, attributed to low inventory. Um, I know that there's multiple offer situations is a common occurrence is what I'm hearing. So obviously we all know in the economic development business, uh, Missy and Sean particularly know that the real estate business is a barometer of what's happening uh, in the community, and so, uh, you know, it's we we are a we are a community that uh, takes challenges and, and moves forward. But the fact that the realtors could adapt to this new uh, normal, uh, semi-normal, and be able to conduct business like they have is is to me amazing. So, I uh, really want to thank you, thank you for that, Missy. I'm uh, I see that. Uh, your pretty face is back on live. So I want to ask, see if you have any updates on anything in, in the last five minutes that uh, you might want to share. I don't really have too many updates. I will echo, you know, Donna, we appreciate, I'm amazed how many people are buying and selling houses during this time. Um, our Ashley Timmy was one of them that bought a house in 24 hours and sold her house in 12 hours. And so um, I think it's indicative of our market and how, you know, I wish that we did have more inventory in Jefferson City. I hear that quite a bit that, you know, it's hard for people to find houses in Jefferson City. So I, I do wish that we had more inventory. Um, I guess I would just, we haven't really mentioned the tornado a year ago today. I know Rick had some comments in his chat about thanking everyone that, um, you know, helped and responded. And I was listening to John Marsh and Austin Peterson this morning reliving a year ago today, which is really kind of surreal. And if you drive around our community, you still will see that, of course, as Ann Back says, it's a, it's a marathon and not a sprint. Um, but we, I kind of joke a little bit about um, in the last year, it's like tornadoes and COVID and hail, oh my, you know, it's like we need to get t-shirts or, or something. We've, we've been through a lot in our community in the last in the last year and you know I hate to sound like a broken record like everybody else and um, but you know stronger together and um, you know we all need to stick together and and you know rally around our community which we are really really good about doing so uh, thank you to everyone that that helped with the tornado and um, be thinking about that today um, okay. you know we, we are busy I, just one more thing um, we are busy and Sean can talk about this um, more than I, but I'm also amazed about our existing businesses that have, um, you know, that we are in contact with on a daily basis that are growing and expanding and adding on. And so I'm, you know, very optimistic about that as well. I mean, of course, we do still hear about um, the companies that are furloughing and laying off, but there are some silver linings in there. And I don't know, Sean, if you want to address that at all, but um, we have, you know, many of our companies are doing very, very well, even in this trying time. Sean, do you want to comment on any of that? Unmute your microphone. Yeah, Sean. there we go. Oh, there we go. And it, no, I'll, I'll echo, <clears throat> uh, obviously you're correct, Missy, I'll, I'll echo your thoughts. You know, I'm talking to some of our going out and making visits, um, our manufacturing community um, is still very, very strong. There's a couple, couple weak spots uh, around the, the printing uh, industry as, you know, events and conferences and things as such have, have slowed down or stopped completely. 
but some of the small businesses as they come online uh, in the downtown area, you know, they, they've still had online sales, uh, you know, front door pickups. So yes, our restaurants uh, and some of our service community have really taken a hit, you know, the hotels. Uh, but overall, overall, uh, I've received a lot of positive uh, comments. And, you know, a couple of our large employers, uh, Unilever, ABB, they're out looking, they're adding jobs right now. Uh, they're running, running strong because of the business. So uh, overall, uh, I think we're in, we're in good shape, but nowhere near out of the woods. One of the things, Thank you. Oh. This, this is my last comment, Randy, then I'll be quiet. But one of the things that we're struggling with a little bit, and ABB is a prime example of that, is yes, you know, the, the stimulus money was good. Um, but the unemployment insurance that individuals that are, you know, receiving that extra $600 in their unemployment benefits is actually kind of hurting our workforce. Mm -hmm. Those benefits last until the end of July. And many people find that it's uh, more of a benefit for them to stay home and collect that unemployment than it is to go out and find a job for $15 an hour or $17 an hour. Um, so that's a little bit of the struggle that we're having right now. So if you know anyone looking for a job, send them our direction. And, um, you, you know, on our job board, we have all kinds of postings. We've been trying to share information. Like Sean said, ABB is hiring. They'd, ha they'd take 50 people today if they could find them. So if you know anyone looking, send them our direction. Thank you. Okay, well, we've, we've kind of come to the end of the hour and I really appreciate everybody participating today. One, once again, thanks to Representative Rudy Veet for being on. Uh, and Richard, thank you so much for sharing your insight. Really yep. good information. I always have people asking me about the, the city use tax and Wayfair and everything else. So I think those on the meeting today have really uh, benefited from your expertise. Feel free to call me anytime. Any, any of you call me anytime. Okay, and Kelsey, I'm gonna let you close it out if you have any parting comments. Yeah, so just uh, send a reminder here in a half hour, we'll be out on the chamber steps. So if you wanna join us for the caravan, uh, feel free to come out. Thanks everybody. Have a great Thank Memorial you. Day weekend. Stay safe, Thank please. Thank you very much. Thank you.